Welcome inside the RX Muscle Studios for another episode of Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. Glad you can join us on this Wednesday, the 10th day of August in the year 2016. This show is brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit SpeciesNutrition.com. 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation. We are now, I believe, five weeks away from Olympia weekend. So all your questions on the current contest season, on pros, uh, it is all on the table. As we bring in Dave Palumbo, Dave, big news for you and for one of your uh, most dearest clients, uh, it's safe to say that, as Akeem Williams clinches his first Olympia qualification this past weekend at the Tampa Pro. We're going to have him here in studio tomorrow for live with at 3 p.m. I've been uh, telling Akeem, you know, since I started working with him about five years ago, he's, you know, people don't realize he's only been training and competing for four or five years. He's still a newbie, and it just goes to show you how talented this guy is. I said, look, you're going to hit it. There's going to be a day where I tell you you've arrived and you're going to win your first pro show. And he hadn't heard that from me until this year. Uh, I actually said it to him before Baltimore. I said, you've arrived. I said, you deserve to be winning shows now. Because when I saw him next to Dallas McCarver at that Chicago Pro, I said, you could have beaten him had you been in better shape. And he put his nose to the grindstone. He came in. He narrowly lost to Victor. Some people thought, a lot of people thought he might have beaten Victor in Baltimore. But uh, he came back even better in, in, in uh, Tampa. I know he didn't want to do the show because he'd been dieting a long time. We forced him to do it pretty much. He wins convincingly, you know, very close contest, but he convincingly, you know, pulled it off. Uh, he got invited by the Arnold Classic people to do the Arnold Asia in Hong Kong in two weeks. And how do you say no to Arnold, right? So he'll be going out there as well, even though he's already qualified for the Olympia now to try to pick up another win. Uh, or top placing, and then we'll see him in uh, Las Vegas. So Akeem's been <laughs> dieting for a very long time, and we'll talk to him tomorrow. It's going to be nice to ha finally talk to him or interview him after he's won his first pro show. It kind of changes your whole demeanor. Also, I want to just mention that uh, another client of mine, Sheila Black, won the Women's Bodybuilding Pro Division as well, and that qualified her for that Rising Phoenix uh, show, which, by the way, they've moved from San Antonio to Phoenix, Arizona, which is just appropriate because it's called the Rising Phoenix show, so uh, no pun intended, of course. It will be held uh, in September. Uh, that'll be their Olympia of sorts, the Women's Bodybuilding Olympia of sorts. So Sheila's qualified for that. I want to congratulate her. She overcame a lot of hardships uh, over the last year, lost her uh, her husband, boyfriend, uh, and she uh, she regrouped. She put her, you know, her head into the sport of bodybuilding, immersed herself in it, and uh, she came out on top. So uh, congratulations to her. So it was a good weekend for uh, Team Palumbo, and uh, – <laughs> we got a couple, another big shows coming up still, right before the Olympia. Once again, with that Arnold Asia. You know, it's crazy how many Arnold shows there are now all over the freaking world. It's like you can't even keep track of them anymore. But this might be, uh, I think this is, I don't know if it's going to be a big show this time around. But I believe in a couple of years, it's going to be a destination show. A lot of people are going to want to go there. Uh, Johnny and I were in Hong Kong uh, about two years ago uh, when we went to Macau. Uh, we took a, a jet boat over there, and we spent the day there. I had a great time. I love it. As a matter of fact, if I would have ditched all the people I was there with, including my wife Amanda and Johnny, I would have spent probably 10 hours on uh, Fish Street. Fish Street there is is it's one shop after the next of aquarium fish. It's like a mile long, and there's like a million shops. I, I, I was going crazy there. I had just gotten my, my leg operated on. I was hobbling around, but I, I didn't want to leave, and I only left because everyone else was, was, was burnt out by them. But I would have stayed there uh, all day long. So if I can get a chance to go back to Hong Kong sometime in the future, now that they have this Arnold Asia there, I'm going to be there. Fish Street sounds like it has some damn good seafood. No seafood. No, no eating food. <laughs> it's all fish you could buy to put oh, in your, your fish tanks. Aquarium fish. On that note, if you want to join in on the fun, ask Dave a question, you can join us on the Muscle Central Forum on rxmuscle.com. As we state every week, especially now, during the contest season, and especially being five weeks out of the Olympia, if you want full access to all the photo galleries and all the analysis for the Olympia and the build-up to the Olympia, that is the place to do it. It is free to register. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you're watching us for the first time ever, hit the subscribe button below. You're not going to miss any of our shows, any of our analysis segments. 
uh, or any of the content that we're going to have between now and Olympia weekend. See, we're over 52,000 subscribers. And just two weeks yeah. ago, we were at, what, 48,000? And I asked people, I said, hey, mm. I know you guys are out there. I know you love watching the show and, and me answering all your questions. Just do us a favor. Show us the love. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed to the channel. This way you'll never miss anything. Plus, it also shows us that, that, that there's people out there that enjoy what we're doing. And that inspires me to give more of my time and my energy to you guys to educate you and enlighten you, hopefully. So uh, show us the love. We're going for 75,000 uh, subscribers now. I would love to have it before the end of the year. As always, we appreciate your support uh, for the existing members, for those new to the RX Muscle communities. Also, a reminder, uh, following this show, we have live with, with the 2016 Arnold Classic Men's Physique Champion, Brandon Hendricks, and he's going to be joining us live from Schaumburg, Illinois. And then after that, Dave and John Romano return for another episode of Iron Rage. We'll start and, and I want to mention one more thing. <laughs> not, to, not We're giving so much information, we haven't even answered a single question yet. Also, on the rxmuscle.com Facebook page, John Romano, Chris Aceto, mm -hmm. myself, and whoever shows up are going to be are doing a new show. It's actually an old show brought back as a new show in video format. It's called After Hours. We do it Friday. If we're all around on Friday, you will you can go on the Facebook page and watch it live. It will not be on YouTube, so you'll need to subscribe to the uh, Facebook page. Uh, the, it's rxmuscle.com, and you can watch uh, After Hours. I don't. We got so many TV shows. I'm confusing them. After Hours, which is basically a show about whatever we want to talk about <laughs> that went on over the course of the week, the month, the year, whatever it is. If you like to just hang out and listen to us chat, that's the show for you. Friday afternoons, actually right now, if you go on our Facebook page, uh, it's facebook.com slash rxmuscle.com, all one word. Check out After Hours. It was last Friday afternoon. It, it is literally like it's like the Seinfeld of the bodybuilding world. It's a fun <laughs> time. It's a good time. You will enjoy it. Let's get to the questions. We're going to start with Gorilla. Hey, Dave, I hate this show more than Blackman hates unshredded glutes. In my 20s, your diet and hard training got me into the best shape of my life. As I grew older and less single, I happily went off the diet. Carbs are delicious, but kept lifting without much regard to my weight. Recently, I started experiencing constant back pain and an MRI confirmed I have one disc bulge and another disc is herniated, which will have to be operated on. Now my main goal is to lose weight by any means necessary, and because of my back, I can't do any lifting or rigorous activity. Questions. Would you still recommend your diet for my situation? Two, if so, do I need to tweak the macros or take anything additional because I'm not lifting? Look, you know, a lot of guys ha are finding themselves in the same situation you are, which is, you know what, I'm hurt, I can't work out, I can't burn those calories, I can't break down and build muscle, what am I going to do? I don't want to get fat, you know, but at the same time, I don't want to starve myself. So, you know, the ketogenic diet that I recommend is a good, I guess you could say it's a good thing to do when you have downtime because it enables you to eat high calories because protein and fat has a lot of calories, but yet... You won't get fat because the carb content will be very, very low. So we'll put you into a state of ketosis with low carbs, keep the protein and fat higher, and you should be able to get enough calories to satiate your appetite, but yet not you're not going to eat enough carbohydrates where you're going to release a lot of insulin and store body fat. So I do have people that do that maintenance-wise. I have a guy today who, who contacted me. He's been doing the ketogenic diet for five years, and he, he wants to do a photo shoot, and he wants to just know, you know, Am I going to have a problem if I carb up? And I said, absolutely not. You know, the, the less carbs you do, believe it or not, the more insulin sensitive you become. What that means is that your insulin receptors increase because the body doesn't sense a lot of insulin around because you're not eating carbohydrates. No carbs, low insulin levels. The body doesn't realize that you're not eating carbs. What it thinks is there's not enough insulin receptors, so it increases insulin sensitivity. So that when you finally do eat carbs, you're very insulin sensitive. That means you're not going to over-secrete insulin. That means you're not going to get fat relatively easy. It's the same concept, and I'm going to talk about this on Iron Rage later today, uh, when it comes to resensitizing your androgen receptors, meaning when you go off steroids, they become more sensitive, okay, and you can respond better to lower dosages. Same thing with food. Less insulin, because you're eating less carbs, means more insulin sensitivity. Let's go to Cali Muscle, and I don't think it's that Cali Muscle, but 
Dave, I hate to show so much that I could answer all the pre-workout insulin and keto questions myself by watching one single Ask Dave episode. <laughs> Anyways, I hardly hear you talk about casein protein. Do you ever implement it during contest prep or do you just use it for bulking phases? If so, I'm assuming only consume it before bed or would you even recommend casein at all? Let's look at the gasoline situation in this country, okay? When you go to the pump, okay, uh, are you getting 100% gasoline? No. You're getting about 90 or 85% gasoline. The rest is ethanol, which is basically made from corn. It's fermented corn. It's, it's out grain alcohol. Do you know why they put that in there? Because they water down the gasoline. So it makes it cheaper to make. It makes it go a longer way. Well, the same is true, okay? When we talk about uh, – what was the question? <laughs> about casein. I mean, the same is true when we talk about whey protein. I'm losing my mind today. The same is true when we talk about protein. A lot of companies realize that whey isolate and whey protein in general is very expensive. Casein is less expensive because it's a lower-grade protein. Um, so they figure out how could we put casein into a whey mixture and convince people that it's just as good for them as if they did straight whey isolate, which is not. Um, well, what they say is, well, casein takes longer to digest. We put the casein in there to make a time-release protein, to make it uh, to make it a more efficiently absorbed protein. What they're basically doing is bamboozling you a little bit. Okay, now that's not to say the casein is that is is bad necessarily. I use a little casein in my protolyzed protein pudding. The reason I put it in there is not to make it time-released, although it does to a certain degree make it a time-release protein because it takes longer to assimilate, but. I put it in there because it's a thickening agent because casein gels up a little bit. It gives it more of that puddingish taste to it. But it's still I still have a 90% isolate, you know, 10% casein. Personally, if I had to pick, you know, like most of the protein that I consume during the day, I would stick with whey isolate every time and I would use a fat or fatty acid source to delay the absorption of the whey isolate, which is what fats do. It slows down the transit time through the intestinal tract. So at night, I have my athletes use whey isolate with a tablespoon of all-natural peanut butter or almond butter or macadamia nut oil. That will slow the, the absorption and prevent the whey isolate from being absorbed too quickly and then oxidized for fuel, okay, if that's what you're worried about. Um, to take a pure casein protein at night, claiming that it's going to be a time-release protein, is, is you, you, if you're believing that, you've been bamboozled by the advertising executives who are putting out that rhetoric to convince you to buy a cheaper, lower-grade protein. Let's go to Droll S or Drolls. Hey, Dave, I'm new to the RX Muscle Forum, but you have answered some of my questions on your Instagram page. My question is, do you have any tips on keeping sex drive up during PCT? I'm three weeks into my PCT protocol, and sex drive is almost non-existent. Usually, my sex drive is only gone about the first week of PCT or so, and then it comes back. This time, however, it has not, and I'm concerned, as I've always been very smart about doing my PCT, coming off, etc. Some people, when they do post-cycle therapy or PCT, um, get too extreme with it. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that they're so obsessed with enhancing their own natural testosterone and reducing estrogen in the body that they over-reduce estrogen. In other words, they take Clomid, they take Nulvidex, which are estrogen receptor blockers, they take Arimidex or Femara or Aromacin on top of that, which are aromatase inhibitors, which prevent the production of estrogen. So they got rid of the production of estrogen, and then they're also taking on top of that uh, estrogen receptor blockers. So estrogen has no ability to work in the body whatsoever coupled with the fact that they're not taking anabolics anymore, so they're not even really producing a lot of estrogen, they've wiped out the estrogen in their body, essentially. And what that does is it wipes out your sex drive because some estrogen is necessary to sensitize your body and give it that sex drive to begin with. So don't over-reduce estrogen. Remember, you want to monitor estrogen levels and lower it, but not eliminate it. Okay, that's why a lot of people do very well with my Testolize product from Species Nutrition because it lowers estrogen and lowers DHT, but it doesn't get rid of it altogether, 
which is a problem. Same thing with DHT. You want to lower DHT, but you don't want to eliminate it because you will lose your sex drive if you do that. So once again, it's all about balance. And the only way you can really tell if, if the balance is off of these hormones is to go give blood, okay? And if you don't want to go for blood work, and get blood work done because you don't have insurance or whatever the reason is or you're too lazy, then you're going to have to go by how you feel. And if you're taking a lot of estrogen blockers and you have like feel like you have no sex drive, stop taking so many of them. Let's go to Icon Show Off. Hi, Dave. I hate your show. I just hate it. I have a couple of questions on supplements. What is the benefit of taking a protein shake pre-workout? I guess that's the first. Let's answer that one first. The benefit is there's really no benefit above eating food, but this is what I would do. I would always be busy all during the day, and then I go to the gym, and I'm like, man, I didn't eat anything for two hours, and I kind of feel hungry. I hate working out when I'm hungry. So a shake is good because I can drink a shake in 15 minutes like a workout. So shakes are assimilated very quickly, especially if you use a good quality whey isolate, a high molecular weight carbohydrate. They get into the bloodstream real fast. The problem is they can get in too fast almost, and sometimes you can get low blood sugar while you're training. So my pre-workout a suggestion shake before you go to the gym within, you know, you can, you can take this within an hour, within 10 minutes, whatever you want to do. Uh, this is what I always used to do. And sometimes I still do it to this day um, is, you know, 50 grams away isolate, 40 grams of a high molecular weight carbohydrate. Now I, I always recommend to my clients, at least my isolized way isolate with the carbolized, you know, high molecular weight carb. And then I tell them to put a tablespoon of macadamia nut oil, which I also ironically make. Okay. The mac oil is a, is a source of fat, which will delay the absorption of the carbs and protein just a little bit because it, it's just an oil. It's not going to take that much longer to assimilate and digest because it's not a hard, solid fat, but it will do just enough so that that protein and carbs will last you throughout your workout. And that's what you're looking for. Post-workout, you don't use the fat because you want the carbs and protein to get in as fast as possible because you're looking to recover. Remember, you're not exercising after the gym. You're just recovering. His second part of the question, your thoughts on uh, carboline? Carboline. Yeah, carboline and citrulline. Um, well, citrulline is, is is something you would put in a pre-workout you know, supplement. Like uh, It's similar to arginine and can increase nitric oxide release. Personally, the best nitric oxide releaser, I believe, is uh, beetroot extract. Um, I use that in uh, my nitrilized pre-workout. Uh, it just seems to always work. A lot of the citrulline, arginines... They, they require enzymes to convert them to usable form. And for some reason, when you use them on a regular basis, they stop working as well. Um, so while they're good as an addition to stuff, but I, I really like the beetroot extract. As far as the carbolin goes, um, there are many different f sources of, um, I guess you could say, uh, high molecular weight carbohydrates out there from the waxy mazes to the high weight amylopectins to the, then you have brand names, Vitargo, Carbolin. Carbolize, which is what I use, which is a high weight amylopectin. They're all essentially the same thing. The only they're all high molecular weight carbs. The only difference being is that how they mix, because a lot of them get really goopy and sticky in the bottom of the shaker bottle or the, or the blender. That's why I, when I made Carbolize, what I did was I micronized the hell out of it. I, I micronized it so much that when you scoop it out, it actually almost goes airborne. It's so micronized. It's very. It's like a fine, fine dust, and it mixes really well, and it doesn't clump. Um, the other thing that, that's important to look for in a, in a high molecular weight carbohydrate is taste because a lot of them taste like crap. Matter of fact, most people can't make them taste good because remember, they're not sh there's no sugar in high molecular weight carbs if, if the company is using a good source of it. Um, so they basically taste like chalk. So uh, to make them taste good, you have to have a nice flavoring system. And a lot of people mix them with chocolate proteins. So if you put flavoring in there, like a fruit punch, it doesn't taste good. I make a, uh, a banana that's terrific that will mix with anything. I also make a fruit punch and mango flavor that mix well with vanilla-ish type flavors. I also just started making an unflavored because that seems to be popular. People don't figure, you know what, I'll put my own flavor in there with the, whatever the way I'm taking it is. So um, that's the difference. The difference is between all those high – and these other companies will make you think that, oh, mine's better because blah, 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 because I got this research. Just because someone did research or did a, a study that they paid for, okay, they paid for the study, okay, with their product doesn't mean the other high molecular weight carb that's made up essentially of, of exactly the same constituents, okay, won't do the same thing. The only difference is taste and mixability. That's it. I'm telling you, that's the science of it. You can – 
these people will try to bamboozle you with research up the kazoo. Trust me. If I have enough, if you give me a hundred grand, I'll find a university that will prove anything. Hmm. If I give them that hundred grand, they will prove anything. They can create a situation, or they can create a study where the 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 um, the, the variables will come out to whatever I want them to prove, and that that's why I don't believe any of these studies. Delador wants to know your opinion on ketone supplements. Are there any use for them? No. The reason being is that, you know, these what they do what they've done is they've synthesized synthetic ketones. Okay? Patrick Arnold's one of the geniuses who did it, which is great to have ketones. The problem is if you drink the ketones or put them into your body, okay, just because you might pee ketones, okay, and people would say, Well, you're in ketosis, right? No. The term ketosis refers to the fact that the brain has decided to stop using sugar or glucose as a fuel source and start using fats or ketones. The only way the brain will do that, okay, is if you restrict carbohydrates in the diet for up to 72 hours. Then the brain will switch its metabolism. Putting ketones into the body doesn't mean the brain is using them preferentially as fuel source, okay? It's just extra fuel in there, okay? It's not putting you into ketosis, okay? That's a big mistake, and people try to bamboozle people with that, these companies, because people don't understand the science of what's going on, and they're like, oh, yeah, I peed on the strip. I'm in ketosis. Yeah, but you're not you're, – you have ketones in your blood, okay, but you're not in ketosis. There's a difference. Let's check in with our chat room right now on the YouTube channel. For those that are watching us live uh, on our YouTube channel, our producer, Johnny Styles uh, is going to bring up what we have going on in the chat room. I'll actually find we'll take a question uh, back from the Muscle Central Forum. First few questions that we generally take are from the Muscle Central Forum. And again, there's a reason for that. These are members who are coming to our website. Um, and for many, for the most part, you know, they've been on our site for a long time. So we want to reward them. We want to take their questions first before we go, you know, to our YouTube channel, our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter. Let's go to PTB, who, you know, has been with us for a very long time. Dave, is if one is to consume rice... Which is the best, i.e., most nutritional rice to eat? He goes to list jasmine, basmati, wild, red, or black. Is parboiled rice also a better alternative? I've read it forces nutrients into the grain. Also, your view on other rice alternatives like couscous, quinoa, grits, or cream of wheat? <laughs> Involved question there. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I, I like brown rice as the. Uh, I would say that's probably the healthiest rice, and I usually eat that a lot. Um, uh, if I go to a Chinese restaurant, I'll eat brown rice. If I go to a regular restaurant, I'll ask for brown rice, just because it has the husk on it, so it's got more fiber in it. However, I will tell you this. I'm, a, I'm lazy. I don't like to set up the rice cooker and, and all that stuff, so I buy minute rice. So you know, they have minute, minute rice started making minute brown rice, so I've been using that for years. And all of a sudden, I went to the supermarket a couple, maybe about a year ago, and I noticed they started making minute basmati rice, which I love. I don't know why. Maybe Sid could tell us, because you eat a lot of basmati rice probably coming from your love neck of the woods. It. Why does basmati taste so good? I don't know. It's but got it, a better it's taste. It's probably laced with crack or something. I don't, I don't know. know, but it's really good. Basmati, but having yourself a little kid. Yeah, yeah, basmati rice tastes really good. And so I've been hooked on that. Jasmine is good. Uh, Ron Norman is always is a big jasmine rice person post-workout because it's, it's, it's very glycemic. It really spikes insulin really high above, I think, even over regular white rice. Um, I like the taste of jasmine. I like basmati the best. So I'm hooked on that. Probably if, if, I, if I had a chef and they would cook for me and they would make me quinoa, you know, all these red rices and all these other unusual long grain rices, I would probably eat those. But I'm so freaking lazy. And most people are. Look, we, we eat so many times a day. Who has time to make cook this stuff? I would probably eat the more exotic rices if I had time. But I'm telling you, if you don't have a lot of time and you don't want to spend a lot of money, you can buy the Minute Basmati rice. It's absolutely delicious. I eat it every single night when I come home from dinner, when I come home from the office, every single night, bar none. This is what I do. I take a packet of the of the, the, the boil bags. I open the boil bag. I put it into a into a tup, into Actually, I don't use Tupperware because of Evans at the money. I use a, a ceramic bowl. And then I go and I go into my freezer and I take a bag of mixed vegetables and I put some in there. I add enough water. I put it in the microwave for 10 minutes. I go upstairs, take a shower. By the time I come down, it's ready to eat. It's perfect. The ice cream wants to know, could a high daily intake of coffee lead to any counterproductive effects as far as muscle building is concerned? Look, I've said it before. You don't want to over 
take stimulants in. So if you're drinking 20 cups of coffee a day, it's going to definitely stress you out. You're not going to sleep at night. I have people who tell me, I can't sleep at night. And I ask them if they take drink coffee. And they're like, yeah, I drink a lot, but I drink it early in the day. It can't be affecting me. I'm telling you, when I competed, I would drink coffee at no, no later than 1 p.m. And I still couldn't sleep at, at 12 midnight. So coffee, will the, the caffeine stays in your body a lot longer than you think. Especially the pre-workouts. Guys use pre-workouts. They don't realize these things will not. They may subside over the, you know, after the workout's over, but they'll stay in your system for eight hours. I promise you. You will have to. If you have trouble sleeping at night, stop all your stimulants. I guarantee it will solve your problem. I guarantee it. Okay. So having said that, how many cups of coffee is acceptable? You know, when you're dieting. You know, there's, there's no rules really because I would rather have you drink a cup of coffee and be overstimulated than, than cheat on the diet. So I always tell people try to limit it to three cups if you can do it. Um, I, you know, I drink one or two cups maybe, but I don't even use – I don't drink caffeine. I just like the taste of the, <laughs> the coffee. But try to limit to three cups. I know there's people out there that drink five, six cups a day. If you're having trouble sleeping, that's your problem. Let's go to the YouTube channel chat room and go to King Ronnie. Dave, do you believe in using the same dosages as per your recommendations on pre-contest and off-season cycles, or do you prefer starting low and moving up in dosage incrementally? You know, back in the 90s when Bill Phillips wrote the Anabolic Reference Guide, he used to always show these pyramiding cycles where we'd, you'd start lower, and then as the weeks went on, you'd increase the dose. You know, I, I, I started my career advising people like that, and I wrote a lot of cycles over the years, even in muscular development when I used to write for the magazine. I put a lot of cascading doses like that, but... I feel like you know you, when you know the dose you need to go, just go right up to it. There's no reason to cascade up to it. It's it's really irrelevant. I don't believe in excessive dosages, as a lot of people realize that. I have I have people contact me with kooky emails telling me, "Look, I know I, I need 5,000 milligrams of stuff a week. I, if I'm going to work with you, you're going to I said don't you're not going to tell me what to do. You can do whatever you want. This is what I recommend. I'm I'm by no means conservative. Okay, maybe conservative compared to Boston Lloyd, but by no means conservative. I know the effective dosages that work. You know why? Because I weighed 320 pounds of solid muscle at one point in my career, so I know what works. And I was not an easy gainer. So don't tell me that you know a thousand milligrams of testosterone a week and three or four IU's of GH a week won't build muscle because it will. Okay, look at Akeem Williams. Train like him, and I guarantee you, you will grow muscle. That's the, no problem is no one wants to train hard these days. They want to just take more and more and more drugs. The drug cycles that I recommend, you know, pre-contest versus off-season, are similar, but the drugs are different, okay? It's the way they're stacked differently. So the dosages, uh, you're taking less drugs off-season because you're not taking as many compounds, okay? But once again, off-season is a long period of time. So you can't pound your body with super high dosages for – you know, six months in a row. So you got to take what's called a threshold amount that's going to stimulate muscle and continue to do that over the course of a longer period of time. Because the truth of the matter is, it's not the amount of, of, of drugs you take, it's the length of time you take them that will make it a much more effective cycle for you. Don't look at gains and how much can I make in six, how many gains can I make in six weeks. Say to yourself, how many gains, how much gains can I make in six months? Okay, I've said this before and given this analogy before. If you gain a quarter of a pound a week, okay, in a year, that's a lot of muscle. That's 15 pounds of muscle. So look at it short term. I mean, look at it over the long term rather than short term. Some programming reminders after this show. We're going to be live with Brandon Hendricks in the Arnold 2016 Arnold Classic Men's Physique winner. And then later on, Iron Rage with Dave and Johnny tomorrow, 3 p.m., live with Akeem Williams, fresh off his Tampa Pro win. Let's go back to the chat room. Uh, Viogenics Dine Sid with the exclamation mark. Ask Dave what different steroids affect the mind psychological state, i.e., trend male, a lot of people cold bloody, apparently. <laughs> well, you know, the more androgenic a, a, an anabolic steroid is, the more it will affect your mind, or the, the more aggressive you'll become, the more, you know, psychotic you become, if you want to look at it from that perspective. Uh, the more crazy thoughts you have. Uh, so what are the most an androgenic drugs out there? Well, halotestin would be probably one of them. Trenbolone is four times more androgenic than testosterone. Um, and that's why Trenbolone makes people a little nutty. Uh, testosterone, obviously, is highly androgenic as well. Uh, Dianabol, Anadrol. So those drugs are the highly androgenic drugs. And those, those tend to make you stronger. They may make you 
uh, hold glycogen in the muscle better, so you look, you look fuller on those drugs. Um, but they also make you more aggressive, and they give you more aggressive thoughts. Now, if you're a violent person by nature and you take these compounds, you will become more violent. If you're not a violent person by nature and you take these compounds, you're probably not going to see much of a change in your personality, although some people have a shorter fuse on these. Okay, so you got to be aware of that. Trenbolone seems to be the, the most highly androgenic drug that has the most of those type of uh, aggressive side effects. The reason why halitestin doesn't really get that is because most people don't take it that long. Same thing with Anadrol. No one stays on Anadrol for, for 12 weeks. Okay, you can't do it. It's an oral. It's too toxic. So I think that the trenbolone is, is the main culprit in, in, in the problems that most people have. And if you can't control your personality and you can't control your temper because you're high strung to begin with, you shouldn't be taking trenbolone. All right, that's just the bottom line because it's not worth you snapping and killing someone and going to jail over it. Okay, it's just not worth it. We're taking questions from our YouTube channel. Let's go to Style X. Regarding Olympic Games, do you think athletes like Usain Bolt or Michael Phelps are on some sort of undetectable substances? Now, Dave, this is something that we spoke about off air. You did want to talk about how uh, the Russian team, they had entire teams banned from the Olympics given the doping results from the previous Olympics. Well, here's the problem, okay? I hate to say it, but it's true. Ninety, Probably 98% of the people in the Olympics have used anabolic steroids or some sort of performance enhancing drugs, okay? The advantage that these Olympic athletes have, okay, to a certain degree, is that, especially for the racers, the runners and the swimmers, it's, it doesn't serve you to be on anabolic steroids while you're racing because it slows you down. It, can, it bulks you up and it makes your muscles a little tighter. So what these guys do is in the off season when they train to build strength, okay, and speed, they use anabolics, you know, short acting stuff that has very short half-life so they're not going to get caught. They, they use the growth hormone for recovery and everything like that. And then as the competition approaches, they, they, they taper off the stuff. They already have the built muscle. They already have the strength increases. And by the time the show, by the time the, show, by the, time the Olympics or the, the, the competitions come around, they're clean essentially. So they'll test clean, uh, you know, uh, and all the drug tests they come up with. A couple of them that are dummies will fail, of course, because they didn't time it right. And uh, that's how they get away with it, okay? And uh, it is what it is. It's an elite level. Look, I was looking, I've been watching swimming the last couple of weeks, a uh, couple nights, I guess you could say. And the Olympic records go down every single freaking time the Olympics come around. The world records are constantly dropping. One girl broke the world record by two seconds. That's, that's, that's unbelievable. Usually these races are won by eight-tenths of a second, not even, uh, a tenth of a second. This girl broke the world record by two seconds. She was a mile ahead of everyone else. I'm not saying she was taking anything because I can't prove it, but you know what? World records don't drop routinely, okay, uh, without help, Okay. The human race has not evolved to be more potent and stronger and faster human beings, okay? We've just found a better way to enhance our strength and our recovery and our muscle mass, okay? And that's through the use of performance-enhancing performance drugs. So it's a good thing you asked that question because that is something that we have been getting questions about and it's something that is a very open topic for conversation. Johnny, are we going back? To the chat room we are, and let's go to the Simple Dude 1. Dave, are there any optimal T3, T4, TSH levels to check through blood work for one to go into a cut or continue a cut if it was long? Well, I mean, th there's three hormones essentially that you're checking with, okay? TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. It's a hormone produced by the pituitary gland in your brain. That's The pituitary gland is like the master hormone that controls all the hormones in our body. TSH sends out a signal to the thyroid gland in your neck here, and it says produce thyroid hormone, which is T4 or thyroxin. That T4 then gets converted to a usable form known as T3 or triiodothyronine, okay? T3 is active thyroid hormone. So when you go for blood work, you want to check TSH, you want to check T4, and T3. The truth is the only important aspect of that blood test is the T3 levels because that's your active thyroid hormone. If T3 is normal, everything else should be normal too. Why? Because when T3 is at adequate levels, okay, it will tell the pituitary gland, stop producing excessive amounts of TSH, okay? So TSH levels will be normal. 
And then if TSH levels are normal, the T4 production should be normal, okay? T4 converts to T3 at a certain ratio in the body and, and, and produces what's acceptable values of T3. So when all these, when T3 levels are normal, everything else is normal. It only gets, a monkey wrench only gets thrown into the equation when something's not working right. If your thyroid gland, if you don't have, let's say you don't have enough iodine in your, in your body, which is a precursor to the thyroid hormone. Now your body, your thyroid gland cannot produce enough T4. So your, your brain senses there's low T3 levels. It sends out more TSH. The TSH will overstimulate the thyroid gland and usually causes the gland to hypertrophy and get larger. Now the gland can produce a little more T4 and a little and enough T3. And so you might go for blood work. Your T3 may be low normal. Your T4 may be low normal. But TSH may be high. And you might have a little goiter or, or in your neck. Okay. Once again, that's how you diagnose the different issues of thyroid. Thyroid is a very straightforward, simplistic gland to diagnose if something's wrong with, okay, because of those three hormones and because of we know how they work on such a simple feedback loop. Just to go to our Instagram page, our producer Johnny Styles says we have about 500 people watching us live right now in our YouTube channel. And again, we can't state this enough how much we appreciate all your support. This is why we put in all this time and effort to serve you fans of bodybuilding and fans of the RX muscle community. So if you're watching right now, believe me, this is not one of those solicitations just for our own personal gain. Hit the thumbs up. It's going to help us get more exposure and it's just going to allow us to better serve you and make more of these content videos. And it's just, it's just going to be, it's just going to allow us to get out there more. And again, we appreciate your support. Let's go to Jason CH 33. Hi Dave. I hate this show so much that I'm going to unsubscribe right after you answer my question. So maybe we shouldn't ask this question. Is there any way to prevent gyno while on a cycle? And if somehow you still get it, even though you try preventing it, is there any way to continue on the cycle while solving this issue? Look, some women have big breasts. Some women have small breasts. Some men have gyno. Some men don't. It's the same philosophy. It's genetic. And what stimulates genetics to, to come into play. Well, in a woman, when she hits puberty and she produces estrogen, the estrogen makes her glands grow in her breasts. If she has a lot of glands there, genetically speaking, she's going to have big boobs. If she has small glands, like we know women who have very flat chests, then she's going to have small breasts. Same thing with men, bodybuilders. If you genetically have a lot of glandular tissue there and you take testosterone and stuff that aromatizes to estrogen because you can never prevent all the aromatization from occurring, okay, you're going to produce, your glands are going to enlarge a little bit. I, the first shot of testosterone I ever took, which was not, I didn't start with testosterone. I started with taking other stuff. The first shot of testosterone I ever took, I remember, the next day I had gyno. I always had glands there, but the gyno inflated it. Like the glands hypertrophied. I got little nodules under there. And that's why I went right to Dr. Blau, who I had, really didn't know at the time. And uh, I got my gyno taken out because I, I didn't want to deal with it. I said, I'm not going to be obsessing over this for the rest of my bodybuilding career, even though I didn't even know what, a, what kind of a career I was going to have. But I was young, and I knew I wanted to do this for a long time. I got the glands taken out. I didn't care what it cost me. I put it on a credit card. I paid it off. But uh, that's, that's the bottom line. If you have a lot of glandular tissue... There's nothing that you could take all the all the Nolvidex, all the Arimidex, all the Femara aromas and you want. You're not going to stop those glands from growing. If you have small, small glands or a very little, you know, small population of glands there, then you probably have a much better shot at, at, at neutralizing some of what estrogen does in the body by taking your Nolvidexes or your aromatic, aromatase inhibitors because you have much less gland to work on. Okay, so once again, it comes down to genetics. Ultimately, I don't really know any pro bodybuilders that have not had the surgery. So ultimately, most guys have to give in and get, and get it done. Our producer, Johnny Styles would kill me for even raising the suggestion, Dave. But given that we have about 25 unanswered questions, at some point, do you see the show going to about 45 minutes? We get this question all the time. Look, I could go for a long time. It does. It's a little draining after the show's over, yeah. and I and I have other. I have we have more programming to do today, so I tend to keep the shows a little shorter on days that we have multiple programming. Um, you know, I could, I could do this every day, five days a week, and I'm sure people would have unlimited questions. But sometimes, if you, I got to give small doses of it, so people look forward to it. If I do it all the time, people take for granted. You know what we're doing here. So we'll take two to three more questions again. If you want to reach out uh, beyond this show. Uh, you can ask your questions in the Muscle Central Forum, and we'll make sure Dave 
uh, addresses them. So let's go to fire underscore off underscore God. What a name. What are some good websites to use for getting blood work done? You know, one of the best websites that's actually really cheap if you don't have insurance is Life Extension, believe it or not. There's a test that one of my uh, uh, hypochondriac friends, Scooter Honig, uh, told me about. It was to – they could actually test – I don't know if it was him or someone else. They told me – it wasn't him actually, but he, I should tell him about this because he likes to test his blood. Uh, there's a test where you can determine if you have a, a predilection or if there's any cancer in your body. I forget the name of the test. And it's like a $600 test. And actually, my friend Steve Barron told me that. And you can go on Life Extension, and for like 60 bucks, you can get it done. So if you go to lifeextension.com, it's a great website. Um, and they got some good products there, too. Um, you could get your blood work done relatively cheaply if you don't have insurance. If you have insurance, there's, you might as well just go to the doctor, and, and it's going to be covered. So um, Life Extension tends to be probably the, the best bang for your buck. We have a question about Kevin Lavroni. Let me just uh, – I wanted to just – Look at his Instagram page to ensure that uh, what this, uh, what well, the question was that was accurate. So the question is, well, this is from Fitness underscore seven seventy three. He says, Phil Heath talking smack about Kevin Lavroni, but Kevin Lavroni has not been on social media lately, so that might be a bit of a surprise. I, I am not trying to, I'm not sure what he's trying to get at here, but I think what he's trying to get at is like, is Kevin Lavroni laying low? And I checked the last video in which he's featured, and that's, if you look at the top row, the second one, that was four days ago. The first video is featuring his son, so I don't really know if that really is featuring Kevin Lavroni. The one in the top row, of the third one, that's the one that came out early last week where Kevin Lavroni addresses both his haters and his fans. So, Dave, I'll, I'll phrase the question for Fitness 773. Is Kevin Lavroni laying low as we go into the stretch run to well, the Olympia? Well, I don't know that much about it, but I'm, if you look, if Johnny, go back to his main, the main page there. Look at the, the, the his picture, his profile picture. It looks like he has, what does he have, like tape over his mouth or something like that? Ah. Headphones. Headphones. So he's, he obviously, symbolic. It looks, symbolic like, he's, yeah, it looks yeah. like he's gagging himself. So maybe mm. he's trying to lay low. I, do, I haven't talked to him in a couple days, but... Um, knowing him, he's probably looking so good that he's, he's, he figures, you know what, I'm going to shut it down now and I'm not going to let anyone see. Let these guys sweat it out, which is a good strategy because, you know what, they got to peek at what he's capable of. But I told you, the last six weeks of a Lavroni contest prep is brutal. The changes that will occur over these next couple weeks will be so monumental that if people have a certain image of him in his mind, when they see him on stage, they're going to be like, oh, my God. I know people give me a lot of shit about the fact that I picked him to win the Olympia. And you know what? If I'm if I'm right, there's gonna be a lot of people that owe me a lot of apologies. This guy's good. Uh, I think Phil doesn't like the fact that people are are taking a guy who hasn't competed in 13 years and saying, "Hey, uh, are you gonna be able to beat this guy?" I don't blame him. He's Mr. Olympia. He's, he, he doesn't feel it's warranted. But you know what? At the same time, in the back of his head, he's got to be thinking, "Hey, I wonder if this guy's for real." I you know I've never competed against him. He's a genetic freak. He's an unknown factor. Phil knows his other competitors. He knows how to exploit their weaknesses. He knows nothing about Lavroni, and that's always a danger factor. A wild card in any lineup is always scary. And so Phil, I think, is, is trying to rationalize, hey, yeah, this guy is 52. There's no way he can stand next to me. I'm a five-time Mr. Olympia. And he may be right, but we'll find out at the Olympia. Take one more question, and this one is one that I wanted to save towards the end of the episode. It's a bit of a long-winded question, so I'll just get right to the meat of the question. It's from Sharky0707, and the question is, uh, where do you see RX Muscle in five years? Any more personal goals you would want to achieve by then? And I'm guessing he means RX Muscle and non-RX Muscle related. Well, you know, my my – Latest uh, mission statement, uh, right before, uh, that I made, and then right after Blackman came out with the Y cut back, when I cut back, you know, was was I wanted to really focus on original TV programming. Granted, we still do some contest coverage uh, at the big shows. We'll be at the Olympia, we're at the Arnold, you know, at the New York Pro. But by and far, most of our program, most of our energy is now being focused towards original TV programming, which we've blazed the forefront and, uh, and, and pushed the boundaries of what was capable. We're the only people doing live programming uh, in the bodybuilding and fitness industry. We'll probably continue to be the only people doing live programming for quite some time. Uh, other sites out there have tried to you know, 
do what we're doing. They're obviously not doing a very good job. So I want to continue to increase the production value of what we're doing. We're working on a new studio uh, in the future. I want to have more programming, more uh, unique programming uh, that I can present you guys with. Because let's face it, uh, when people go home and they're into bodybuilding, they want to watch bodybuilding programming. M more and more people every day are watching this stuff, not only on their phones, but on their TV sets. Uh, it's, it's, you know, used to go home and you'd watch whatever the latest sitcom or whatever the latest, you know, uh, movie happens to be on TV. Now people go home and they watch YouTube. They watch whatever the latest, you know, bodybuilding and fitness programming is. And I think we have a lot of great stuff to offer. We don't offer schlock or people who are just taking other people's stories and commenting on it, you know, for the sake of it, making fun of it, whatever. We actually talk about the topics today. We debate, we interview the, the top competitors, uh, in-depth, real meat and potatoes, not fluff stuff. Because I hate fluff stuff. I hate, how do you feel? I just won the show. How do you feel? I don't like those questions. Of course he feels good. He just won his fucking show. <laughs> and if he didn't win, he doesn't feel good. That's not what I want to know. I want to know what makes people tick. You know, when Andre Ferguson was here for his live with interview yesterday, I, I sat with him for an hour before we did the interview because we he came early. And I didn't really know much about him. And I found out this guy This guy used to run the streets. You know, he was a, he was a bad guy. He was almost arrested. He did, did bad shit. And I realized that even though he didn't tell me this, that bodybuilding saved his life. And he, he admitted it at the end. He's like, yeah, you know what? If I didn't get into bodybuilding, I probably would be in jail or dead or who knows or worse. So um, you got to find out what makes people tick. That's what people are attracted to. When I watch the Olympics every night on TV, the reason I enjoy watching it is because there's a backstory on every single competitor. What makes them tick? Why, you know, what got them to this show? Where they came from? What they overcame? You know, what they had to sacrifice? That's why you enjoy seeing these people win. I'm almost, I, I, I got to be honest with you, I get tears in my eyes after every, every freaking event I watch. It could be air rifle shooting. When I, because I hear that backstory and I could relate to what the person underwent, what sacrifices they made what they gave up to be where they are today. And that's what I want to focus on for the future of RX Muscle. Emotionally uh, vested stories, uh, programming that doesn't fluff it up, uh, addressing the topics of the day, the truth in bodybuilding. With that, we are going to end another episode of Ask Dave. Again, brought to you by Species Nutrition Visit speciesnutrition.com. You might be wondering why Dave is sitting in front of a panel of SciTech products. Well, we are five weeks away from the Olympia and the build-up to the Olympia, the iron road to the Olympia, and of course, all our Olympia coverage is sponsored by SciTech Nutrition, and we couldn't be more happier to partner up with them again. We partnered up with them for the Arnold Classic, and they provided us with generous support, and we look forward to working with them over the next five weeks and in to the Olympia. Brandon Hendrickson, men's physique, Arnold Classic champion is up next. And then after that, Iron Rage with Dave and John Romano tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live with Akeem Williams. The BK Beast is going to join us live in studio to talk about his big win at the Tampa Pro and clinching his first ever qualification to the Olympia. For Johnny Styles and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you in a few minutes.